So welcome to Productive Discourse. Productive Discourse is a place where we talk about positive activities to take place within our community. In other words, we're always looking for that shiny needle of common ground in that haystack of fear. We're taking some time now to celebrate summer. And we're gonna celebrate summer by talking baseball, particularly Alameda Park League Baseball, the T-shirt league that began in the 1950s. Our guest today is James McGee, an alumni who played a year of Park League Baseball. James is also an author of a book. He's written three books and has a fourth one coming out about legends of Alameda Youth Sports. He even found a place to put me in the book. So I really appreciated that in volume three. James, welcome to Productive Discourse. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for having me. Well, we appreciate you being here. First, I'd like to ask you how you're doing during these crazy times. What are you doing to stay happy and healthy during the pandemic? Well, it's been really interesting as it is for everybody. Uh, Currently, I'm, uh, I'm teaching second grade. I had taught in middle school for many years after doing some coaching years ago. Mm-hmm. And in, uh, with the pandemic, we were able to make things work where we had uh, kids all on Zoom. Uh, so I learned about Zoom, which was good. And, uh, and then little by little, I work in a private school. We were able to have some kids come back after a while. So we ended up by the end of the year having um, about two thirds of the kids in the room with their masks and the other kids on Zoom. So it worked out pretty well. Um, you know, made the best of it. And, uh, you know, just just to try to keep a positive attitude and had a little extra time to do some more reading and a little bit of writing, which I love to do on the side. And now that it's summer, I have a little time to work on more of my writing. And uh, my wife, Christina, uh, she was very supportive with me as a teacher through the years. And, and this year she was extra supportive because she could hear me from the next room, you know, trying to be, <laughs> trying to be funny and keep the kids uh, interested. So, uh, but uh, now it's a little break in the summer. I used to teach summer school and coach for many years, and now I'm uh, working in the summer, just working on my writing projects and, and things like that. So, so overall doing really well. Luckily, we're very blessed. Good, good. So you and your family are feeling good and staying healthy. Yep. Great, great. Now, when you were growing up, uh, what was your home park? Well, you know, we were in an interesting position. We were in between uh, Ensenal and San Jose Avenues, and we were on Pearl Street, just near Broadway. And I was there for many, many years after starting out on Alameda Avenue, which I don't remember. I was really young at that time. But uh, we were right in between, almost equidistant from Cruzy Park, from Edison School and Lincoln Park, just maybe a block or two further. So we had lots of opportunities. Um, originally, we would hang out at Edison when we were really young. And then uh, Cruzy, uh, because we went to kindergarten at Otis. My brothers and I, we went on to Catholic school after that at St. Philip Neri. And, uh, but then by the time I was five, six, seven years old, uh, Lincoln became pretty much our, our home park. And we were there a lot. Um, and... Uh, I was looking through my garage the other day, and of course, it's always wonderful to look through boxes you haven't looked through in a while. And I was able to find my first glove from 1970. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's a Rico Petroselli Spalding mitt here. All and, right. Uh, 1970, uh, the only year I did play officially on the Park Leagues, but I did play for the Lincoln Lions in 1970 as a six year old uh, with T ball. And I can tell you, I was really good at hitting the T. <laughs> in the T. <laughs> I hit the T really well. Well, what happened is we'd swing so hard, our, our our bat would go one way, our head would go the other way, and we'd have. Our, if you looked at bat speed, it was probably pretty good, but we didn't know where the bat was going, did we? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, do you remember who your park directors were? You know, I to be honest, I don't know for sure, but I have a feeling. I heard a lot of people saying around that time for Lincoln, it was uh, Barry Weiss, although I'm not sure if that's accurate or not. might have been. Um, we spent some time on the baseball field, and we also spent some time in the, the old house there near the front of the park that uh, used to be an arts and crafts building when I was a youngster. And uh, my mom was an artist. Uh, and my dad had, was a retired Marine, so we had an interesting uh, home life. 
but uh, so we did lots of things at the park. And on the baseball diamond, a lot of us would go down uh, as often as we could. We were lucky on my street, on Pearl Street, uh, growing up, I was one of the youngest on the street, but it was nice because on one hand, we had tons of boys on the street. There were nine, 10, 11 boys on the street within just the one block on both sides within three, four years of each other. We only had one or two girls that I remember, and, and they weren't really tomboys. So they, didn't, they didn't really play with us with street football and going down to the park. But uh, so we would spend a lot of time at Lincoln Park, though, on the on the, the diamond when it was available. And our uh, we were Giants fans, still are this day. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, <laughs> Uh, my wife's dad, my, my late father-in-law, played for the New York Giants, uh, Jack Lucky Lorkey. If anybody wants to look up uh, Jack Lucky Lorkey, very interesting history. But, um, but growing up, we were Giants fans, but everyone else on the street were A's fans, which is understandable. And uh, they would always have those small green Oakland A's giveaway bats that yeah, were just big right. for a little kid. I can remember using those, and somebody always had a couple of rubber hard balls. And of course, a bucket of tennis balls. When we were lucky, we would have those too with us. So, so lots of great times down there. Yeah. Now, James, you're talking about the bats from Bat Day, right? Yep. Yeah. That if if anybody's listening and doesn't know baseball from Major League Baseball from the late '60s and '70s, baseball teams early in the season used to give on a particular Saturday would give every kid. They came into the park, a real bat. And it's just, you think back 50, 50 or 55 years ago, every kid in the park having a bat compared to, to you know, trying to do something like that now. But they take the bats, and anybody that still has their bats is probably a great collectible. But what we did, what we did growing up is we never thought collectible, we had a use for it. We went out and played baseball. So we used the bats and, oh gosh, we just had a great time. I think one of my bats was a Campy Campaneris and then the other one was a Joe Rudy bat. We had a Campy Campaneris bat. I remember that for sure. I'm not sure about Joe Rudy, but I know we had a Campy bat. And, uh, you know, what we would do on occasion, uh, our, the best friends in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, on the street, they were across the street and down on the corner and it was two boys, um, Sadly, their father passed away when they were very young. So it was mm. the mom and grandma raising them. In fact, the mom, kind of a side note, uh, the mom worked at Ward's uh, across the bridge and grandma right. used to babysit for income. And grandma used to babysit, babysit for Kenny Stabler's little daughter, I remember back in the early to wow. mid-70s. So we'd always see the snake driving up in his silver Corvette, which was a thrill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But we used to go to the park, the, the four of us, and sometimes... Uh, my two brothers and I, and then the five of us, my little brother was old enough. We actually would walk from Pearl Street and Encinal to the Oakland Coliseum. We would just walk there. Mm -hmm. It would take, you know, a couple hours. We'd go to a game and then walk back. Um, for San Francisco games, I remember taking the O bus right around the corner for 25 cents, I think, all the way to the terminal in San Francisco. And then we'd have to transfer to go to Candlestick. And that was quite a trek, too. Yeah. That... There's a common theme with the story of walking to the Coliseum or taking the bus to San Francisco to Candlestick and Park League Baseball or, or anything with the Alameda Recreation and Park Department. It was that you'd get up in the morning. We'd get, we were kids. We'd get up in the morning and go to the park or go to our activities. We knew what time we were supposed to be home but we didn't have our parents hovering all over us, uh, hovering over us all the time. Uh, is that how it was for you, James? Yeah, definitely. We would be at the park. And, and the rule of thumb for us was whether we were at Cruzy or Lincoln, usually at Lincoln, was <clears throat> when it started to get dusk, we knew that was the time to start walking home because it took about 20 minutes to walk home. Yeah. And if it was dusk when we left the park, by the time we got home, it would be you know, close to dark and you, know, you had to be in by the time it was it was definitely uh, getting dark. So right, right, and, and that's not to say mom and dad didn't know what we were doing because if something happened and we got in trouble and they found out about it, there's going to be no more trouble at home. <laughs> you know, so if we did something and the park director had to call the parents, or if we did something at school and the school teacher had to call the parents, they were going to. They were going to handle it, but during the day, we 
you know, we had our activities and we didn't have a lot of, I guess you can call it micromanaging or, or they weren't scheduling for us. We scheduled our own activities, made up our own games to play. And it, it, it was really a good time. Now, when you were, did you play flag football or anything like that at Lincoln Park? We would just, I didn't play in any leagues at that time. I just, my brother, my older brother did. He played flag football for Lincoln Lions and he mm -hmm. played uh, for the Colts, the Truzy Colts for a uh, t-shirt baseball a couple of years. Oh, okay. And, uh, at the time I was focusing more on basketball and, uh, you know, I, I, to be honest with baseball, I, with St. Philip Neri School, we had the CYO program. Right, I, right. I a couple of times and at that time we had uh, a really solid team every year, year in and year out. In fact, I mean, some of the names you'll know, we had uh, Kenny Arnerich, two years ahead of me at St. Fulton area that played CYO baseball. And of course, his dad, Lil Arnerich, did a lot to start up, I guess, the T-shirt leagues in Alameda. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful man. And um, so we had lots of competition with the public school kids and private school kids uh, mingled together on the same teams, which was really nice. And then we would kind of branch off. Some of those guys would end up going to the parks. So there were, it was nice because it wasn't just one thing or one team. You had all different opportunities. And like you said, there was, it was kind of open-ended, you know, we were able to, to go on our own. And I think our parents trusted that the park directors were always there in case there was ever a big problem, you know, that we could always trust them and work with them. And uh, in fact, one time at Cruzy Park, I remember uh, the only time I ever remember getting in trouble at a park was. Uh, they were, I was waiting to get into a game and, and then on the side, a couple of us were playing, uh, I think we call it base runner where you're going back and forth, right. you know, with a, <laughs> two guys throwing the ball and, uh, we started playing and, and next thing you know, we had a, a rock throwing contest to see if we <laughs> and, uh, and one of the rocks that I let loose with, it went, unfortunately so far, I couldn't hit and I couldn't run, but I could throw. It went so far, I went into the playground on the far end opposite the state, the uh, park director's little station there and hit a kid in the leg. Luckily, the kid was okay, but at that point, they said, you're banned for life from Cruzy Park. <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I'm going to you know, ha hang out at Lincoln from here on in. <laughs> and then, of course, a couple weeks later, I was back at Cruzy and no one said anything. It was an accident. Uh, it was an accident. <laughs> yeah, there, there, were, there was always stuff that happened. Uh, there were, yep. uh, but, but somehow we got through it and it, it worked. So when you played CYO, you played for St. Philip Neri, right? Yeah. Okay. And then did... Did the other parishes in Alameda have have teams too? Yeah, we. Um, I participated in basketball and I tried out for baseball a couple times. And the, mm -hmm. the competition was so fierce, I never made a baseball team. I came close a few times, uh, but we did have St. Joseph's had had teams, baseball and and basketball, and St. Barnabas, which is now uh, the school is no longer open. St. Barnabas also had teams. And they tended to have, uh, their teams tended to be for basketball, at least maybe seven, eight players. And baseball, they could barely field a team. They had a, a smaller enrollment than St. Joseph's and St. And Philip Neri. But it was, a, it was a lot of fun. A lot of guys, and a, most guys played baseball and basketball both. I remember in 1977, we had a, a great team, St. Philip Neri, with uh, some of the Lincoln School kids. We had Rich Bullock Jr., one of our pitchers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joe Perry uh, Jr. was one of our pitchers. We had a kid named John Bennett. I don't know if you know that name, but we called him Big John Bennett. He had a, a little beard going in, in seventh grade. <laughs> uh, he was another pitcher, and uh, Morris Gustin, uh, lots of lots of different guys. So, so lots of competition, and and then when you know, then we went on to high school, and a lot of guys kind of went into different sports, and some stuck with it with baseball, but uh, yeah, lots right. lots of great times. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because whether it was the parks or whether it was uh, the parishes that had the CYO basketball, kids kind of stayed, they played with their neighborhood kids, and then they would find out about kids on the other parts of town, and then they'd eventually meet up on the baseball field, the basketball court, or wherever. Was there a kid in a in another part of Alameda that everybody was talking about that y'all looked for when you played their team? 
You know, I remember a couple of guys. One was a, a kid uh, named John Randolph. He was my age, and he was a legend that down. He was at Wood, uh, Wood School at one time, and then he was down um, Longfellow. I think that was Longfellow Tigers, if I remember correctly. Right, he was, right. He was Longfellow, and then he was kind of bouncing around. He actually was over in Oakland at a, a school and a CYO at a park. And then he ended up uh, being one of the top uh, football players at Alameda High School for a couple of years. And, mm -hmm. and now he's, uh, he's down in Southern California doing security work, evidently. Interesting. But he was, Interesting. That was one of the names. And then another, another kid that, that I heard about for a couple of years and I finally met, and he was down on the Lincoln, the Lincoln Park side of town. It was Mike Reno. He was, uh, he was kind of a multi-talented uh, athlete. He, could, he played some soccer got into football, baseball, basketball, and uh, the Reno family, you probably know them, but real, real good, good people. Right, right. Uh, everybody has their moment. You, you talked about your moment throwing the rock, you had a good arm. <laughs> Do you have another moment, maybe your greatest moment in U sports? Well, I would have to say, um, I had a couple of them. I was really fortunate. I, I, I started out slow and worked really hard. By the time I was in high school, I had some success. And uh, I guess it would be uh, my junior year of basketball at Alameda High School. After playing, uh, I played in the parks freshman year and sophomore year. I played for Godfrey my freshman year mm -hmm. for park uh, for rec basketball. We had the Godfrey t-shirt. and We played all the games at the boys club, I remember, which was wonderful. Uh, and then sophomore year, I played, uh, they kind of recruited me to Longfellow. I didn't make the team at Alameda High freshman and sophomore year in basketball. But junior and senior year, I did make the teams, which was nice. And junior year, um, had a good year. You know, I was more of a defensive guy, that what have you. And then finally, we find out at the end of the year, the last game, it was a last minute thing, maybe a week before, we hear we're going to play Encinal at the College of Alameda because that way we'll have more seats for the fans. Mm -hmm. So I got to play Ensenal High School. I came off of the bench and we were down at halftime. I think it was 29-15, very low scoring first half. I play in the second half and we end up winning the game 43 to 41. And it was so exciting because right at the end was one of those moments you, in baseball, it would be you're in the backyard thinking about bases loaded, you know, bottom of the ninth. And in basketball, you think, you know, tie game, no time on the clock. I'm at the free throw line. Well, that's what happened that, that night against the Jets. And uh, fortunately, the first free throw uh, was in and out, but it went in. And the second free throw was all net. And we ended up winning the game. And that was with less than a minute left where I got to make the two free throws. And the, the place was packed, College of Alameda. I don't know how many people were there, maybe 2,000. Right. Sure. But, uh, but for, a, for a young, uh, for a teenager, that was you know, pretty surreal and pretty exciting. So <laughs> That's good stuff. That's good. Those are unforgettable. And you've, I mean, you not only embraced it when you grew up, you, you wrote the books. Uh, what motivated you to do the research? Because you don't just write about your generation or the kids you grew up with. You, you wrote about the entire, the entire history of Alameda Youth Sports and the legends that came through it. What created the idea for you? You know, it's really interesting. It was uh, kind of at a, a time in my life where it was kind of at a crossroads. I had been a coach and a teacher for uh, 15, 20 years, and then I decided to get into administration. And it was a good job. I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I was working in the schools. And uh, after five, six, seven years, I thought, you know what, I think I'm going to go back to teaching. And finally, I did that. Well, the year I went back to teaching, I was able to have a nice long summer beforehand. And I started, for the first time, reconnecting with some former teammates. And one of them was Rich Bullock, Jr. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had the idea. I, call, I said, Rich, you know what? It's so great talking. I said, you know, you're a real legend. And that's the first time I ever used the word legend, actually, in my lexicon. And when I said that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write a chapter about Rich Bullock, Jr. Just tell about all the greatness, you know, things he did with ba basketball and, and baseball and, and just being such a great person. And after I did that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to post it on Facebook. So some of my old friends will see it. So long story short, I got so much good feedback that I thought I'm going to do some more people. And next thing you know, I have 10 or 15 people, mostly around from my era, 
And uh, people are saying, you know what? Let me tell you about my uncle. Let me tell you about my grandfather. Let me tell you about my neighbor from the 40s and the 50s. And before I knew it, I had close to 100 legends uh, in my what was to become my first book, Alameda Legends. And I ended up going over 100, getting close to 200 and then more and more. And I started even branching out, Steve, where it wasn't athletics only. It was just sometimes just really good people that I had met or I had heard of, kind of unsung heroes, that type, those type of uh, uh, men and women. And, uh, and to this day, I mean, I could, of course, I could go, you could go just countless. There's so many great people from the island city that I have met and that I have heard of. And then you just learn about more and more. So it's been a great experience and it's been great for me as a teacher so I can share some of my books. I've been self-publishing on Amazon. So if anybody's interested, believe me, it's very simple to do. And for Amazon self-publishing, it's called KDP Publishing now. Um, it's free and it's a little bit complicated at first, but anybody can figure it out. And uh, after you self-publish, you can always uh, add to it. You can get some of the bells and whistles that actually do, do cost a little bit of money. But but it's a great thing. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, well, my story is not important enough to tell. Trust me, everybody has a story. In fact, my dream someday is to have a, a show on cable TV called Everybody Has a Story. And we're going to have people come on and tell a story from their life that, that means a lot to them that I think would mean a lot to others, too. Oh, that's great. And it, I, I totally agree that everybody has a story. And we're living at a time now, whether it's you know, this little podcast I'm doing, or you self publishing a book, there are so many avenues, so many platforms for people right now to where if you have something to say, there's a place for you to do it. And you don't have to get permission from anybody. You just go out, put it out there, and somebody's going to enjoy it. So uh, I agree with you 100%. So with that, uh, what's next on your bucket list? Well, I've got two. I've got two lists. Uh, the one, I, the one I, that's the most immediate is for this summer. I want to learn how to play the accordion. All right, that's a good one. I inherited my uncle's accordion. My my favorite uncle, my uncle Joe Kinsella, wonderful man. And uh, I don't play any instruments. My wife can play. My brothers are both musicians. So I'd like to learn how to play that at least at a rudimentary level over the next month or two, at least to get started. And uh, definitely want to get out and ride a horse again. I haven't done that in years. But as far as writing, um, the Baseball Odyssey, I wrote a book about my uh, late father-in-law, Jack Lucky Lorkey. Volume one, that, that turned out really well. And, and I was so lucky, Marty Lurie heard about it, kind of a secondhand thing. He interviewed me uh, some months back. That worked out really well. But uh, I'm actually working on a couple of projects. I'm working on uh, a book for Paul Yazzolino, uh, his life story. The, he's a uh, world champion power lifter. Mr. USA, and then in his later years, of all things, a world champion cyclist uh, with velodrome cycling uh, in the U.S. and in France. So I'm going to be working with him over the next uh, number of weeks to uh, help him uh, get his life story on the pages of a book. And it's uh, probably going to be called The Unlikely Champion, the Paul Yazzolino story. Hmm. He's a great, great guy. Uh, I actually, a small world thing I found out after the fact I had coached his son in freshman football almost 40 years ago is kind of interesting after we, we chatted a little. So I've got a couple more book, book projects planned and, and uh, before I know it, school will be starting in August and then I'll do a little here and there. Right. Well, that's great. Uh, James, I appreciate you being on the show today. Uh, okay. If somebody wanted to find your books, what would be the best place for them to go? The easiest thing to do is just go to Amazon and, and look for James Francis McGee, the name I use for my author name. Uh, you could also just put in the uh, Alameda Legends, volume one, two, or three. Uh, I have seven or eight books on there now. And uh, But anyway, it's, it's pretty easy. And uh, like I said, if anybody's interested, uh, feel free to uh, send me an email. I'm at cybermcgee at yahoo.com. If you want information on finding out how to write your own book or to self-publish, I can give you some pointers with that. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions about, uh, about any Alameda legends or any people you would like that you think should be included in the next volume, which might be the last one, volume four, later this year, uh, please let me know at cybermcgee at yahoo.com and I'll make sure I connect with you and include uh, the person that you're thinking of. 
All right. Well, sounds good. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today. It's been a lot of fun. And I appreciate all who either watch this on YouTube or listen to it on iTunes. If you'd like to find out more about Productive Discourse, please go to productivediscourse.home.blog. That's where you'll find some great information on what we do and where you can contact me if you'd like me to speak at your service club, community group, or religious organization. Now, our next episode is going to be next week. It'll be episode three of our series on Park League Baseball. So I hope you're with us then. And in the meantime, please like, share, comment, and subscribe so this message can go far and wide. And we'll find that shiny needle of common ground in that haystack.